And we're back. Well... Well, we're not back. We're still here. <laughs> <laughs> Presumably you listened to part one before you're listening to part two. But we've recorded the whole thing, and it's very long, so we decided to split it. I mean, even if you weren't here for part one, welcome. Welcome. It's lovely to have you. Yeah, thank but you so much. this episode probably won't make much sense if you don't listen to episode five. <laughs> But we're very happy you're here. We are. We are incredibly happy you're here. We hope you had a good day. I mean, listening to these episodes might dampen your day. Might, but Might ruin your day? Is that what we're doing to people? I don't think so. <laughs> Probably. Well, this is the Genuinely Spooky podcast. Yes. And the way we split this up, we're going to roll the music, and then it's going to immediately pick up from where we left off. So, in episode five, I started telling Kieran the story of Burke and Hare the infamous murderers from Edinburgh. Should we give a little recap? Because there's probably going to be a week between these. Oh, right enough. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Just a little yeah. little, little refresher. So we had a lot of the why grave robbing was a thing. There was lots of grave robbing happening. Robbing? Grave robbing <laughs> happening. Grave the, robbing happening at the time. Yeah, the the story is in the 1800s. Medicine is being advanced at an alarming rate and doctors need bodies to study. So, like Kieran said, grave robbing was a big problem, but people got wise to it. So bodies were again in short supply. Enter Burke and Hare. <laughs> <laughs> so far in our story, they've began or they've begun their murder spree. And I've regaled Kieran with the horrible details. Mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. don't know if he's enjoyed it. I have. I have. <laughs> Hearing about the first three murders. I think the first three. I think. But we left the last episode bringing Burke and Hare's wives into clearer focus as possible accomplices. Yeah, we were discussing whether or not they were in on it. Mm-hmm. Were they turning a blind eye? Did they just have no idea? You were claiming the next murder says or disproves that they couldn't have known. Yeah, I'm about to make my case that the wives knew what Burke and Hare were up to. I think that the next couple of murders that we're about to talk about make it pretty plain that they couldn't have not known. But that's just my opinion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I hope you like the episode. Hope you enjoy it's weird to just be leaving you here, <laughs> even though to you we're about to come back after the music plays. We are. But we hope you enjoy. Mm-hmm. Now roll the music! <laughs> In February, March of 1828, Margaret Hare invites an elderly woman into the lodging house for drinks and a place to stay. Now, remember I said their victims were generally poor, generally people that they felt nobody would miss, Mm -hmm. which makes this so much more heartbreaking that they were basically... And it happens today. They're basically victimising the people that they deem no one will care about. Well, that's why... Or this is why no one person can be judge. Or you can't judge others. It is just... So you don't get to be the... It's horrible. Judge, jury and executioner. Whoa. So because these people were generally poor and not in a great situation, it was easier to lure them in than you might think. With the promise of like alcohol mm-hmm. or just somewhere to sleep. But apparently Margaret was the one who lured the woman in and Margaret got her drunk on whiskey. I mean, that's not a coincidence. And this murder was a little bit different to the others. The woman was brought to the room that they had put aside for her and Hare put a mattress cover over her face mm. and just left her. They didn't tech or they did smother her, but they put the cover over her face. She had fallen asleep, she was so drunk, and they just left her. Oh. And she was so drunk she couldn't move it, she couldn't save herself, so she was dead by the time night fell. Oh. So Burke and Hare take her to Knox and she gets them another ten pounds. Oh god. As an accident. 
So this murder seems pretty damning mm. when it comes to what Margaret was aware of. Yeah. So she, I'm not saying that she killed anyone. No. But she knew what was going on. Yeah. And Burke even said later in one of his confessions that at one point Margaret told him and Hare that they should kill Nellie, oh Burke's wife, because she was a Scottish woman and they couldn't trust her. <laughs> so she doesn't sound like a nice person. No. I think she knew what was going on. It's those hard features. <laughs> <laughs> but before you feel too sorry for Nellie, who Margaret was conspiring uh-huh. against, here's the next murder. Oh, God. So after they killed the elderly woman, Burke met two young women in the Canningate area of Edinburgh. Uh, And they were called Mary Patterson and Janet Brown. It seems a bit suspect on Burke's part, but I don't really know what his intentions were. But he bought them several drinks and they all had breakfast together. Hmm. And then he invited them back to his brother's house for more drinks. Not to the lodging house where his wife was. Interesting. You see where I'm going? I do. But what annoyed me here, and with several other people in the story and times in the story, loads of people were saying that these two women were sex workers without any evidence to back it up. Now, they may well have been. Mm. You know, it was a common thing. If it's that or starving to death, that's what you're going to do. Yeah. But there's no evidence to prove that that was the case. And it annoys me when that happens as a way to kind of like discredit victims where it makes yeah. their experience less valuable oh, because they were a sex worker. That's not true. So I don't really understand why this is in so many tellings of the story when there's no evidence. That's really weird. Because they may have been and that's... But, you know, it's just the way it is. It's mm-hmm. not a big deal. But I thought that was strange. That is strange. So I just wanted to bring it up that there are things that say that but I couldn't find anything that proved it. Mm-hmm. So... I'm not going to say it. That's my soapbox. I'm going to step off it now. So, once Burke has the woman at his brother's house, this is Constantine, they were in the army together, remember? Yep. Mary Patterson falls asleep at the table because they finished two bottles of whiskey. Oh, that's good work. (laughs) You know, I don't blame her. I wouldn't be in a good way after that. But Burke and Janet Brown keep talking and they keep drinking and... You know, it's a bit suspicious. He's a technically married man. Mm-hmm. And that's when his wife Nellie arrives. And she's furious. <laughs> she completely loses the head. She's screaming at Burke, accusing him of cheating on her. She's probably not wrong. Like, it seems suspicious. Well, yeah, it's definitely not wild accusations. No. But Burke is equally as furious with her for accusing him of being unfaithful. And he gets so angry, he throws a glass at her face and cuts just above her eye. And Janet Brown is watching all of this happen. And she sees them arguing. It's really horrible. She tries to explain that she didn't know Burke was married. He had never said anything. She had no idea. She just wants to get out of there because this has just gone zero to terrible really, really quickly. So she leaves, but she leaves her friend Mary Patterson sleeping at the table. Oh, no. Brown wants no part in the drama. She goes. Oh, I was thinking, how could she do that? Like, well, she's also had an incredibly large amount of whiskey. Exactly, exactly. So apparently this is when Nellie goes to get Hare and Margaret. So remember, they're at Burke's brother's house. So she goes back to the lodging house to get Hare and Margaret. Yep. They arrive. Burke and Hare lock themselves in the room with Patterson, leaving their wives in another room. And they murder Patterson in her sleep. They smother her. So they stash her body. They take her to Knox, who pays them £8 for her. Now, what's awful, and it's remarked upon when they hand over her body, is that she's still warm. Oh. Still warm. Oh, God. These two guys coming up steaming of whiskey. Mm hmm. Or steaming, smelling of whiskey. And oh, I've got a body for you. Great, here's some money. Oh, see you again. And it seems like, from what I read, this is when they really found their stride. This is when they start believing that they're completely untouchable. The Essex Herald said, When they carried the girl Patterson to Knox's, there were a great many boys in the high school yards who followed Burke, crying, They are carrying a corpse. But they got her safely delivered. So they brought her to Knox in broad daylight, having just murdered her. That's how confident they were. 
And Knox was apparently over the moon with how good the condition of the body was because it was such a fresh body. He stored her in, in whiskey for three months before dissecting her because she was so fresh. Oh, nasty. Isn't it? It did. Oh, it's just, it's horrible. But from what I could find, although this is when they seem to be rising in confidence, this is also the first time that any questions were raised at all about the bodies that Burke and Hare were bringing. Mm. The assistant uh, to Knox thought that he recognised Patterson. But Burke explained, oh, that she's just, you know, she drunk herself to death. Um, I bought her from an old woman in Canning Gate who was selling her body. She's, she, you know, she, she drunk herself to death, stupid woman, yada yada. And they just took that at face value. Maybe he was incredibly charming. So they're just like, man, this guy wouldn't tell a lie. Look at him. He's great. I don't know. I really don't oh. know. Some of the people who say that Janet Brown and Mary Patterson were sex workers suggest that the reason they recognised Mary Patterson at the university was because the men had used her services. So they recognised her, mm-hmm. but couldn't really say why. Maybe. Maybe. Could it's be. neither here nor there, yeah. I don't know. Uh, Janet Brown eventually came back to look for her friend, assumedly once she'd sobered up. <laughs> but they told her that uh, Patterson had left Edinburgh completely, that she had met a travelling salesman and had travelled to Glasgow with him. And she was gone. I don't know what she did. She went, oh, okay. I mean, what could you do? Like, if she genuinely believed that they had killed her, are you going to push them for well, information? No, you're going to leave. Because what's going to stop them from killing you? Yeah, you know. Oh, no. So you have to th- you have to think about it that way. That she was also in just as much danger as her friend was, and then to go back, there's not much he could do. But what really cements for me with this murder that the wives knew what was going on is that Nellie kept Patterson's skirt and petticoats. She kept them and wore them. Oh now, God! Doesn't that oh. sound? Like, revenge to you? Oh, yeah. Because it does to me. Yeah, that's definitely like a power trip, isn't it? And unfortunately, the murders just kept going. In early to mid-1828, Burke and Hare killed a woman called Mrs Haldane. And then when her daughter Margaret came looking for her, knowing that she had stayed at the lodging house, Burke killed her on his own. And then the pair brought her to Knox. And that was another £8. So mother and daughter... In May 1828, Burke smothered an elderly woman by himself. Hare wasn't there. But they both bring her to Knox and they make another £10. Then it was Effie. She was a cinder gatherer and she scavenged through bins uh, to sell what she found. And Burke knew her because she had sold him scraps of leather. Hmm. Because remember, he's a cobbler. He's not a full-time murderer. Oh yeah, he just has a job. So she was lured into the lodging house with whiskey, she was smothered, and she was sold for £10. Oh, God. And after that comes the murder that they got away with literally under the nose of the police. Literally. But I should say that the police force was pretty new at this point, and Edinburgh was one of the first places that actually had a police force. Mm. And they had a huge host (coughs) of jobs to do. Not just police work as we understand it. So it, it was their job to maintain order, arrest criminals, investigate crimes. Mm-hmm. But they also had to physically keep the streets clean. That oh. was also their job. So they had to move on beggars and layabouts. And they were the ones who lit the street lights. Oh, that's interesting. So they, they had a lot to do. They had a really huge remit. Cleaning up the streets. So they were pretty dependent on the people of Edinburgh coming to them with crimes. Mm. Because they couldn't, they couldn't do it. So I'll say that just now. But that doesn't excuse what happened next. (laughs) Burke was wandering through Edinburgh, quite close to Tanner's Close, where he lived. And he came upon a woman who was so drunk she couldn't stand. And she was being helped to her feet and helped back home by a police constable who had found her. And Burke intervened, saying that he would take her home. He knew her. He could vouch for her. She was a good person. She's Mm -hmm. just drunk. To try and keep her out of trouble. Uh... The constable gave her to Burke. Oh, no. And she was murdered and sold for £10. Oh, God. And I have in my notes, the next murder is pretty horrible. (laughs) (laughs) So it's only getting worse from here. Made a note of that. Yeah. 
I read a book a while ago called Ordinary Men, and it was the one that was documenting how in World War Two, ordinary German, I think it was police officers, or it was the special like military police that was formed, went from being just regular people to executioners of all these like Jewish people mostly. It's a slippery slope when it comes to listening to authority, I think. Yeah, and just, they would just get pushed that step forward. I think the steps were slightly more incremental than yeah. Burke and Hare's were, but it is really interesting how you can go from being just a person to everyone else be like, oh, well, like, maybe this is okay. Well, and convincing yourself that what you're doing is okay. I yeah. think that's the frightening thing. Because, like you said, you can fully imagine that the way that they're doing this is, oh, well, nobody cares about these people anyway. Like, they're causing trouble and, you know, they're good for nothing. They're elderly. They're sick. You know, yeah. it'd be very easy to convince yourself what you're doing is fine. Especially when there's the group of you. So mm-hmm. you all, you you back up each other's theories. Oh, like, th- th- this one's okay, this one's okay, because of these reasons. If we're not doing this, that would be way worse. Yeah. It's really interesting that you bring that up now, because the next murder seems to be the one, at least for Burke, that wasn't that way. This okay. was one that really troubled him, which hadn't happened before. So, in June 1828, so they've been murdering for, like, six months, an elderly woman and her dumb grandson. So he couldn't speak. Okay. <laughs> I'm not saying this. Here, no. That's, that's why I have it in my notes, meaning he couldn't speak. So he was mute. He couldn't talk. Got you. They were staying at the lodging house. Burke and Hare smothered this woman in her room while her grandson was in the main room of the lodging house, completely oblivious to what was going on. And then once she was dead, they went through and got the boy brought him into the room and killed him there. Oh, God. It's absolutely horrendous. That, oh. Oh. Some reports go further than the traditional method of killing. They say that they killed this old woman using painkillers and that Hare killed the boy by breaking his back over his knee. Ooh. But these don't seem to be true. Mm. There's no evidence that this was the case. Again, it's people adding spice to the story as time goes on. I I believe that they just went about it in their usual way because that's what worked. And why why wouldn't they do it the normal way that was working was effective? It seems like less effort. Mm -hmm. When Burke confessed later, he said that he and Hare were almost always very drunk when they committed the murders. They'd always had a lot to drink. And I guess you'd need to be. Well, you've got to numb yourself to it somehow, don't you? Because, like I said, they weren't killing because they enjoyed killing, as far as we know. They were killing because it was profitable. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they were always very drunk. But Burke said that killing this boy haunted him for the rest of his life. He was haunted by his face. He couldn't get it out of his head. Um, He said that he couldn't sleep unless he kept a bottle of whiskey beside his bed. So when he woke up during the night... He would take huge big gulps of whiskey to put him back to sleep. And he lit a candle by his bed all night, every night. So it seems like this was the one that he was uncomfortable with. So it's interesting having that discussion about what ordinary men will do, convincing themselves it's okay. This one, he couldn't convince himself it was okay. But he carried on. Yes. Oh, that's that's bizarre. It was that one. Mm -hmm. That was the, like, straw... Well, I wondered if it was because it was a child. Yeah. Someone innocent. That it hadn't been up until this point. So they had two bodies that they had to deal with. They didn't fit in the tea chest this time. So they stuffed the bodies into a herring barrel. And they got eight pounds for each of them. But... Burke said that they loaded the barrel onto a cart, a Mm -hmm. horse-drawn cart, because they couldn't carry it, it was too heavy. But the horse that was pulling the cart wouldn't go the whole way. It got part of the way to the surgery and stopped and refused to move. Weird. So that caused them a lot of problems. They had to move the barrel manually after that. And apparently Hare was so angry that this had happened, when they got back, he shot the horse. Oh my god. Mm -hmm. Ooh, they're definitely <clears throat> starting to like twig. It seems like a slip. Yeah. From what I could see, 
it, it really unsettled me that yeah. he had that bout of anger and lashed out like that. It's not a calculated business transaction, that's just being angry. Yeah, that's being angry and killing something. Mm-hmm. Not, so, sorry. Not someone, but something. Yeah. So now it's the 24th of June. And it seems like the brotherly friendship between Burke and Hare is going to come to an end. Burke and Nellie go to visit her dad in Falkirk. And when they come back, Hare seems to be flush with cash. Even though when they left, he was having to pawn his clothes and his belongings because he was absolutely broke. He had no money. Which if they're buying whiskey all the time, Mm -hmm. makes sense. So Bert questions him and questions him. But Hare is adamant that he didn't sell a body. He didn't make any kind of deal without Bert being there. He wouldn't do that. He wouldn't cut him out of their arrangement like Mm -hmm. that. However, Bert doesn't trust his... Bert doesn't trust his murderer pal. (laughs) Shock horror. And he goes to see Knox in secret without telling Hare. And Knox tells him, yep, Hare came to me with a body, a woman's body. And he sold it to me for eight pounds. Oh. Burke returns to Hare and he's livid. He's livid that he's been cut out of this deal. And Hare kept all of the money that they were supposed to keep together. And the two men are so mad at each other that they start physically fighting with each other. And then Burke and Nellie move out. They move into Burke's cousin's lodging house, a man called John Brogan, and it's two streets away from Hare's lodging house. So they move out. Things are bad. I'm surprised it took probably like six murders to get to that point. Well, remember, this is possibly the first time they've been apart. It might have been the first opportunity. Well, yeah. For one of them to strike out on their own. Yeah. Or I just meant that they haven't just... Like, they could still function together in the same house. Uh, yeah, true. They're just like, sweet, everything's fine, this is all great. There's no, like, mental anguish that forms into just anger at everything and everyone and each other. But I guess when they're the only other person who understands what you've done... Yeah. You, you would kind of stick together, wouldn't you? And they need each other to keep doing it. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Or that's what Burke thought. Oh, yeah. Or so they thought. Mm-hmm. So, angsty music is playing. <laughs> the band seems broken up forever. No. Except that it wasn't. The next murder happened about three months later, in September, October time. And they were thick as thieves again. They were totally fine. Uh, Hare was visiting Burke at Brogan's lodging house when the woman who did the washing, like she washed all the clothes for the house, she showed up. And that was the only thing that she did. That was her only mistake, was turning up to the lodging house on the day that Burke and Hare were there together. And they killed her in the usual way and sold her to Knox for £8 that afternoon. Jeez, oh. Mm -hmm. Their next murder, and by now we're on at least 14. So there might be more, Mm -hmm. but we're, according to like official confessions and records, we are on at least murder number 14 was only a couple of weeks after this. And appallingly, they murdered one of Nellie's relatives. What? A woman called Anne McDougall. She was visiting them from Falkirk and they murdered her and sold her for £10. Oh, oh my God. Whoa, makes me shiver. Mm-hmm. The next murder, in my mind, is when things really start going downhill for the pair. <laughs> <laughs> if you can call it that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's downhill for them because they murder someone who's kind of well-known in and about Edinburgh, which was a mistake, basically. The James Wilson was 18, and he was known in the streets of the city as a beggar and an entertainer. And that wasn't uncommon, but he stood out because he was mentally disabled and because he had some kind of deformity in his feet that meant he walked around with a limp. So he was very recognisable. People knew him. And from all accounts, he was a nice person. He didn't cause any harm. He was known locally as Daft Jamie. I think in a kind of endearing way. Yeah, yeah. Um, He wasn't a nuisance. He wasn't a threat. He was widely liked. He just kind of kept himself. And, you know, that's what he did. But in November 1828, Hare sees Wilson and lures him into the lodging house saying that he has whiskey. And once Wilson's inside, Hare sends his wife Margaret to go and get Burke. 
because uh, remember he's living somewhere else now. Which again, I think is a strong case for showing that Margaret knew what was happening. Yeah, I think they definitely knew. I mean, but- I see a lot of cases where people, like modern true crime cases where they wonder, oh, how did the partner not know? And sometimes, genuinely, they have no idea. Yeah. I'm not saying that that's not true, because that absolutely happens. I just think in this case, they knew. Yeah, I think in this case. I don't think they killed anyone, but I think they knew what was happening and decided that they were okay with it. Well, yeah, I don't think they physically did the killing with their hands, but they definitely like aided in it I think and so. let it happen and didn't report it. But yeah, I'm not saying that all partners or family of murderers know exactly what's going on all the time because mm-hmm. that that's not true it a lot of the time the family of a murderer are are victims too mm-hmm. in their own way just want to make that clear burke and Hare had a harder time killing james wilson than they had had with others uh for one thing wilson may have been the first victim that they had a hard time getting drunk because he didn't like whiskey oh <laughs> So they hadn't really had that before. He preferred snuff, which is a type of tobacco. Oh, yeah. And that you, you just inhale. Mm-hmm. He preferred that to alcohol, to whiskey. And they still managed to get him drunk, but he wasn't as drunk as the other victims had been. Because he didn't like it. Mm-hmm. Also, Wilson was 18. He wasn't a child. He wasn't elderly. He was in pretty good shape. He was pretty big. He was strong. So when the men came at him, he fought them off. He fought back. And he did his best to get them off, but it was still two against one. Mm-hmm. So in the end, they, they murdered him. And the men, they even stole his snuff box and his snuff spoon. Each of them took one. Oh. Oh. It just seems like just another insult. Yeah. Ooh. So remember, I said Wilson was known around Edinburgh as Daft Jamie. So when the men brought Wilson's body to Knox, he bought it. But when students started examining the body, they told Knox that they knew who he was. They recognised him. Mm. And Knox, being the stand-up gentleman that he was, told them they were being ridiculous and that there was no way this was someone that they knew. It just couldn't happen. But as word started to spread that Daft Jamie was missing, Knox apparently moved the dissection of his body ahead of others he already had in storage. And he removed the head and feet of the body before he dissected it in front of his students. Oh, ho, ho, ho. No. So then you don't see his face and you don't see his feet, which were deformed and that's why he had the limp. No. Tell me that Knox didn't know what was going on. You tell me. I can't. He fully knew. He must have known. Even if he didn't know before, he must have known by this point. (laughs) So, in a theatrical turn, we're on to the final murder. When everything goes tits up. (laughs) And it was on Halloween 1828. (laughs) I'm not joking. (laughs) Burke met a woman called Margaret Doherty while he was out in Edinburgh and decided she would be a good candidate for getting murdered. She was from Ireland, so he fed her some story about how she was related to his mother because she was also a Doherty and they were from the same part of Ireland. And he invited Doherty back to Brogan's lodging house for drinks and a catch-up because they were family, you know? He must have been quite the charmer. You wonder, don't you? To be able to talk all these people into these things. Mm -hmm. Well, especially convincing someone, oh, we're related. Yeah, yeah. No, we're not. <laughs> Unless it's like some distant cousin, you know, big families, it happens. Yeah. But that's what he did. Burke took Doherty back to Brogan's lodging house. He introduced her to his wife. And then he left the pair to go out and get whiskey for some drinking. But what he really did was go and get Hare for some killing. Hare returns with Burke. But before they can start getting Doherty drunk, Burke has to take care of one more thing. Because remember, Brogan's house was a lodging house. Yep. They weren't the only guests. Anne and James Gray were a couple who were staying at the lodging house with their children. And obviously Burke and Hare can't have witnesses to what they're about to do. So Burke pays the couple to take their children and go stay at Hare's lodging house for the night explaining that Doherty's a relative, we really want her to stay with us, we want to catch up, would you mind going and staying there for the night instead so she can stay here? And they do. 
it seems a reasonable explanation. Yeah, it's it's fine. That that's but, believable. Well, like, if I heard that, I wouldn't stop a family from getting together. I don't know you'd be a bit like, oh, that's kind of annoying. Okay, but they're, sure. But they're being paid. Yeah. You know, they're not. They're making money. They're not losing money. So the Greys leave, and Doherty is now in serious danger, although she doesn't know it yet. The Greys return that night at about 10pm, which we know because the Greys describe this night later. And they come back to pick up some things they'd forgotten, some things for their children. And when they arrive at the lodging house, they see that the group is very drunk. So the four are there, Burke and Hare, the wives, and Doherty's with them. So they're all very drunk. There's lots of noise, shouting, dancing, singing. The Greys leave. Not uncommon. No. No, a family catching up. Yeah. But they notice that the five of them are there. They're all very drunk. They're all together. Doherty's murdered. But the men don't take her to knock straight away. They actually stash her body under the bed in what had been the Grey's room. Uh. Now, I'm not really sure why they didn't take her straight away. I couldn't find a reason for that. Maybe they're too drunk. Maybe. It could have been. It, it seems to be what they did with the others. They took them pretty quickly but for some reason they didn't with Doherty's body morning comes the greys return to Brogan's lodging house because they were only staying away one night and they're expecting to go back into the room that they had before Um, but they get very suspicious because Burke won't let them in the room Mm. and they don't know why, there's no good reason Anne explains that she left a couple of things behind in the room that she needs, so she needs to get in the room but Burke will not let her in on account of the dead body. <laughs> oh, so you can't go in there and murder someone. Okay, pretty much. Can, can, can I come in now? No. Sorry. Later in the day, so they came round initially in the morning to return to their room and get their stuff. They weren't allowed. Later in the day, the Greys find that they're in the lodging house alone. So they sneak up to the room to go and get their stuff. Yeah. They don't mean any harm. They just don't know why they haven't been allowed in this room. So they go up into the room. They search it because they're fairly certain something's going on. They're acting very strange. And this is when they find Doherty's body stashed under the bed. (sighs) Apparently with blood and saliva on her face. So something's gone wrong. Very, very wrong. And obviously they're horrified. It's like something out of a horror movie. Yeah. I can't even imagine. No. To find a dead body that's been attacked. Mm -hmm. They leave the lodging house and they head straight to the police station. They know that they saw Doherty with the, the four the night before and they're certain that they've killed her. Like She was fine the night before. This body is obviously hidden well, yeah, and it's, has gone through some distress. It's under the bed, not on the bed. So they go to the police. But Nellie, Burke's wife, either catches up to the couple or meets them heading the other way. Uh, and she soon realises what's going on. Uh, she knows that they're going to the police. And she actually tries to bribe them into not reporting the murder. Oh. She tries to offer them £10 a week for their silence. I'm assuming... That she made this offer kind of knowing that Burke and Hare would just kill them later so they'd never have to pay. I was about to say, man, that's really expensive. Like, oh, actually, no, it isn't. You give them £10, then you murder them and take £10 back. Exactly. And they that, get an extra £10 for the body. That's kind of what I assumed. Yeah. But she tries. She tries to bribe them into not going. Oh. But the couple refuse. They're not having it. They go to the police. And it's while the Greys are gone that Burke and Hare take Doherty's body to Knox and they sell it. But I don't know if they knew at that point that they'd been found out or if it was just by chance. I don't know if Nellie had warned them so they took the body to get rid of it or if that's what they had planned to do anyway. Yeah, I wonder. I don't know. Either way, the police come to Brogan's lodging house and they question Burke and Nellie. They question them separately and they both give completely different accounts of what happened the night before. So they know they're lying Mm -hmm. even though the two of them were together. And later, when the police are searching the house and searching the room, they find Doherty's clothes hidden under the bed, and they're covered in blood. So Burke and Nellie are taken into custody. 
because they have enough. Mm-hmm. And Hare and Margaret are arrested later the same day, once more details come out and they find them. So the police either discover or guess that Burke and Hare sold Doherty's body. I don't know if the Greys knew that somehow or if they just kind of thought that that's what would have happened. I suppose it would be a good lead to ask about first. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they go to Knox's surgery to search and they find who they believe is her and James Gray comes to the surgery and is able to identify her as the woman that they saw the night before. Mm-hmm. So now they know that she was dead in the lodging house and her body was sold. Everyone's in big trouble. John Brogan, who is Burke's cousin, he owns the lodging house. He's initially suspected as being part of it, but he's released pretty quickly because they realise he had nothing to do with the murder. Like the Greys never saw him at any point. He's cleared. Burke, Nellie, Hare and Margaret are all questioned while they're under arrest. They're questioned separately and again they all give different accounts, different memories, different recollections of what happened that night. Even though the Greys have proven that they were all together so they should all be telling the same story. Yeah. They give different details of when Doherty left. You know, basic things like that. So the police know that they're lying. I said before, it was pretty impossible to prove that Burke and Hare had actually murdered their victims because they suffocated them. And it was difficult to prove with forensics at that time. Mm -hmm. But experts examined the body and they did believe that she had been murdered by suffocation. But that's all they could say. That this is what they believe. They couldn't say for sure because they, they just didn't have any kind of tools to be able to do that. I wonder if there's an irony that they had to examine more bodies before they could figure out stuff like that. Well, you wonder, don't you? But this was a big problem because although the forensic specialists were saying that this could be true, that wasn't enough to charge somebody with murder. So that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, Robert Christensen was one of the forensic specialists and he interviewed Dr Knox since... You know, he has a role to play in all of this. Well, he's been buying all these bodies. So when he speaks to Knox, Knox claims that he was told that Burke and Hare got all the bodies that they did by observing observing all the lodging houses in Edinburgh. So they watched all the lodging houses and when someone died, they jumped in and purchased the bodies before they could be buried. So that was their business. That's how all the bodies were brought to Knox. Yeah. That was the impression he was under, apparently. Which could have been a legitimate business at the time. Mm-hmm. Is it the, a really weird thing? Like, there is room for him to... I mean, he obviously, like, he chose to believe that. Yeah. I think there's a degree of that, of being comfortable with accepting that story. Yeah, but... Not as truth, but accepting the story. It could it could be a reasonable story. Because, mm-hmm. you know, like I said, like the people who were staying in the lodging houses... Sometimes they weren't in the best situation, so there were cases where nobody was going to claim them. Yeah. So if they were waiting for this to happen, you know, it it could be true. And he's buying bodies from other people, mm-hmm. and they might have similar businesses. Exactly. Ooh. Apparently, Christensen said that Knox was deficient in principle and heart, <laughs> <laughs> but he couldn't prove that Knox did anything wrong. Well, yeah, he... he he didn't, to a point. You can't prove it. Yeah. So, I agree with Christensen. Yeah. But I also agree with the fact that th- there's nothing you could prove there. No. From the fact he's an arsehole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Like with every single story I've told so far, the newspapers got hold of it and they had a field day. <laughs> it happens every single time. Yep. Everyone was terrified of these murderers and everyone became convinced that absolutely anyone who was missing had been a victim of Birkenhair. So, you know, it was panic, mm-hmm. absolute panic. And the police were a bit worried because they were sure that the, these four people had killed Doherty. They didn't have much proof. They're, they needed more if they were going to charge them. Mm-hmm. They didn't have enough. Kind of, you know, like like a modern case. You yeah. have to be able to prove that these people did this thing. Yep. Even how, if you know it's true, you have to prove it. Yeah, that's how, how it should be, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the system. And they were able to get a couple of things. 
but not for Doherty's case. Okay. So Janet Brown, who was Mary Patterson's friend, yep, she went to the police after all this came out because she believed that something happened to her friend and she remembered being with Burke. So she's hearing about this case with Doherty. She goes, hang on, I know him and my friend is missing. Mm. And she was able to identify Patterson's clothes because Nellie had kept the skirt and the petticoats. Oh my God. So it seemed likely that they had murdered her. They now had some proof that Nellie had these things mm-hmm. that she shouldn't have had, basically. Yep. The police were also told by a local baker that I couldn't find the name of that Burke's nephew, Constantine's son, was going around town wearing trousers that had belonged to Daft Jamie. Mm. So now the four so now the four were accused of Mary Patterson's murder and James Wilson's murder on top of Mary Doherty's murder. Oh. oh. But they still didn't have enough. So the prosecution team went for an option that angered a lot of people. And it was really the only option they had. They spoke to Hare on December 1st. So there's been about a month. And told him that if he turned King's evidence, which meant admitting your own guilt, ratting out all your accomplices in return for immunity or a lesser sentence, then he would get full immunity. Full immunity? If Hare betrayed Burke then he wouldn't be charged for 17 murders. What? I wonder, because you kept referencing his confession. I'm like, oh, why is it only his confession? Why, why, what happened? Well, Hare made a confession. He took the deal. But from what I read, Hare's confession has been lost. Oh. Like the document, it doesn't exist anymore. Hmm. But Hare made a confession, and he threw Burke and Nelly under the bus big time. He confessed to Doherty's murder and gave them all the details of that night, which gave the prosecution everything they needed. He detailed the night, but because Margaret was his wife, Uh he didn't have to testify against her. There's laws about that, about having to testify against your spouse. So Margaret also got away with everything. (laughs) Even though she wasn't technically his wife. I don't know how that worked. Yeah. But... Hare got immunity, and because he didn't have to testify against his wife, Margaret was also spared. What? So on December 4th, Burke and Nellie were formally charged with the murders of Mary Patterson, James Wilson, and Mary Doherty. But Hare and Margaret, although they were still locked up, were not. Oh. Only charged for three of them, too. Mm-hmm. Well, oh. it's, all, it's all they could... They couldn't charge them with anything else. As far as they know... There's suspicions that they've murdered other people, but that's it. <laughs> right, who do you think I've murdered? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, we'll just go with those only. Mm-hmm. So, are there others? No. So, the trial itself was just as theatrical and dramatic as the rest of this entire story. You're not going to believe me, <laughs> <laughs> but the trial started at 10am on Christmas Eve. The last murder was on Halloween... Now it's Christmas Eve. <laughs> I couldn't make this up. Whoa. It just seems so improbable. That's bizarre. Right? I, I was really weirded out when I read that for some reason. I just... It's so strange. Yeah. I, what? <laughs> you, you couldn't make it up. But I was worried you weren't going to believe me. <laughs> <laughs> making it up for the better story. But I swear this is how it happened. And during the time between Halloween and Christmas... The story of what Burke and Hare had done was everywhere. Everyone knew their name. And on the day of the trial, a huge crowd turned up just to see what would happen, Mm -hmm. what the outcome would be. 300 police constables, along with infantry and cavalry, were at Edinburgh's Parliament House to maintain order among the crowd. Fuck. So that's, that's where the trial was happening, and the crowd was so big and so angry that they had to keep them under control. And that happens today with certain cases that capture the imagination. Like people get so upset that there are big crowds outside yeah. courthouses and things because people are upset. Especially if the result of the trial isn't what they would hope. You know, it, it still happens. So it seems strange then, but 
it seems to be part of human nature because mm-hmm. it still it still happens. And this trial had the twist and turns of any trial. The judge decided they weren't allowed to stop the trial for dinner or meals at any point, since the judge felt that this could jeopardise the legitimacy of the trial. He didn't want anything about the trial to be called into question and for them to get off with it. So he decided that they would run the trial until it was complete. So Burke and Nelly actually had to eat their meals in the courtroom. (laughs) And reports at the time talk about them getting their... Like prison meal of soup mm-hmm. and bread at 6pm and having to eat it like, in the dock because the trial didn't stop. Mm-hmm. The defence lawyers said that it was unfair that Burke and Nelly were being tried together. Which I guess makes sense because they're both being tried for murder when their defence could argue that like you know like Nelly wasn't as yeah. Guilty as he was. He was a murderer. She was an accomplice to murder. But they were being tried together. They're... So they said that this was unfair. Mm-hmm. But that was ignored. They were tried together. The defence also said it wasn't fair for them to be charged with all three murders at the same time. Hmm. So the trial was for the three murders. But they said, well, these three murders are unconnected, uh, completely different happened like far far apart they shouldn't be tried together and the judge agreed so the judge said that they were going to try each murder separately Mm -hmm. but remembered that the sentence for being found guilty of murder is death oh (laughs) so they only need one to stick and they have the death penalty so there was that law that got rid of the mandatory death sentence for all these offenses except murder if you were found guilty of murder, you were executed. That was the law. Um, so they were split up. There were going to be different trials for different murders. But the prosecution was allowed to choose which murder would be tried first. Mm. And they went with Doherty's murder because they had the most evidence. So they were the most confident that this one was going to... Stick. Yeah. So they went with that. Burke and Nelly pleaded not guilty, but everything was against them. 55 witnesses were called by the prosecution. Or there were 55 witnesses on the list that were Mm -hmm. allowed to be called. I don't know if they called all of them. But on this list, there was Hare, Knox, and Knox's assistant, David Patterson. (coughs) (laughs) Yes, I know this person was murdered because I helped and I was there and we murdered him together. Well, when Hare took the stand, he said that Burke killed Doherty. Ah. that Hare had nothing to do with it and that Nelly had actually stopped Doherty from escaping so he dropped them both in it he said that Nelly helped tricksy bastard the only thing that Hare admitted to doing when it came to Mary Doherty was that he helped Burke bring the body to Knox understandably because Knox would be able to say that the two men were there (laughs) and even though they asked Hare about the other murders he didn't have to answer Hmm. Because this trial was only about Doherty's murder. He didn't have to answer questions about any other case. Because that's not what was being put on trial. Yeah. So he stayed completely silent. So he didn't have to answer. He got to be completely silent about all of these awful things that he had done. He didn't have to answer for them. Oh, God. Margaret was even worse. She was even more infuriating. So by the time... By the time this all happened, she and Hare had a young daughter, a baby. And when Margaret took the stand, she took her daughter with her. And her daughter had whooping cough. So oh, yeah. Like children get that sometimes. Mm-hmm. So every time that the baby had to cough, she used that to give herself time to think of an answer to whatever she was being asked. Yeah. So the coughing bought her time so she could make herself look better and she could really think through what she wanted to say. And throughout the whole thing, she claimed that her memory was terrible and she just couldn't remember anything about the night at all. Even though, in my opinion, she was absolutely involved. Yeah. In multiple murders. (laughs) Completely involved. So she was even worse. Oh, God. Uh, Knox got a pretty tough time of it from the public and the press. 
his reputation was basically in tatters. But he didn't face any criminal charges because both Burke and Hare, in the confessions that they gave, cleared him of doing anything wrong, basically. In that way that that they can't prove that he knew. Mm -hmm. But public opinion was not good for, for the old doctor. He was compared to a ringmaster who used Burke and Hare to get what he wanted. He was widely hated. A lot of people felt that he should be on trial for murder, just the same as Burke and Hare were. Yeah. Even though Burke seemed to be the only one who was going to pay for anything, it seemed. Knox even managed to get out of being questioned in court, when I think he should absolutely have been questioned. Yeah. And I'm assuming it's because he was wealthy. That's the only reason I could think that he would be able to get out of that. Because he's a prime witness to all these people that they murdered. Well, yeah, like, did they bring you a body? Yes. Mm -hmm. Was it this body? Yes. I'm pretty sure his assistants weren't questioned either. I'm pretty Uh, sure they weren't called up. So that's why I think they were on the witness list, but they were never called. Mm, Too frightfully important and wealthy. Well, that's what I think. I think he must have done something to get them out of it to try and save their reputation. Or maybe the university stepped in. Maybe. Because it doesn't look good on them either. He sounds like he would consider himself just above all of it mm-hmm. because his work is so important. Well, that's it. It's, don't, don't you understand what we're trying to do? Yeah. It's more important than all of this. So, yeah, he he wasn't charged with anything and he didn't have to answer any questions, but on the outside, it, it, that's what I said at the very beginning, his name was linked with them and that was damning. Just that connection. Crazy. Mm-hmm. At 3 a.m. on Christmas morning, So the trial started at 10 a.m. Christmas Eve. 3 a.m. Christmas morning, Burke's lawyer gave his final statement. He finished. And then at 5 a.m., Nellie's lawyer gave his. Mm -hmm. And at 8.30, the jury retired to decide on a verdict. How long do you think it took them to decide how they were going to judge Burke and Nellie? (laughs) Um, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. 50 minutes. 50? Five zero. A whopping 50 minutes. <laughs> this These decisions can take hours or days. Sometimes they took less than an hour. Wow. And do you want to take a guess at what they decided? What their verdict was? That he was guilty. That he was guilty? Or they were guilty. Even. Okay. Burke was found guilty of murdering uh, Doherty. I think I've called her Mary and Margaret. I don't know. <laughs> Doherty. Um, he was found guilty of murdering her. But Nellie was given the not proven verdict. Hmm. And this is something that's specific to Scotland. And I think it's something that people in government are looking at eradicating like this year, like now. Because the not proven verdict basically means you aren't innocent, but we don't have enough to say that you're definitely guilty. Weird. <laughs> it's this kind of middle ground. Hmm. Which is funny, because it's exactly how I see the wives. Is you're, I cannot say you're innocent. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that you were involved, but there isn't enough to say that you're guilty. Yeah. I wonder what that means if you're not proven. Do you go to jail? Well, no, because you're no. not guilty. Hmm. So I'm pretty sure you're, re- you're or currently, I'm pretty sure you're released, but you're not fully innocent. Oh, God. So that's what happened to Nelly. That's what she got. Burke was sentenced to death and the judge said your body should be publicly dissected and anatomized and I trust that if it is ever customary to preserve skeletons yours will be preserved in order that posterity may keep in remembrance your atrocious crimes. Jesus. Oh, so it's pretty ironic. Yeah. It's all come back around. On January 3rd Burke gave a full confession of all the murders. So this is how we have a lot of the details that we have now. He, mm-hmm. I think he took advice from like priests and ministers who came to see him. And they basically told him to confess mm-hmm. before he died. Well, if he was like so haunted, that would make sense. And he was a religious man. Remember, he had a pipe, oh, yeah. a pipe in his pocket. So yeah, this is how all the details came out. Because the police had no evidence or proof because all the bodies were dissected. Mm-hmm. So they were really dependent on what he told them. So that's the only reason that they knew anything. Burke was publicly hanged on January 28th, 1829. Outside St Giles Cathedral. 
and it was a massive event. A crowd as big as twenty five to fifty thousand people showed up. Whoa. So some reports say twenty five, others say it was as many as forty thousand people showed up in the centre of Edinburgh to watch him hang. That's how hated they were. Jesus. People were even renting out their windows for the event. <laughs> they were charging between five and twenty shillings. I didn't see how much that is today. They were charging that so people could get a better view of the scaffold. That's and I've seen pictures that were drawn. There's one in particular that's in my head, a picture that was drawn of the scene at the time, and it's just the square and it's full of people. But every window in the buildings around it have like three or four people sticking out of every window, looking over the scaffold. It's insane. Wild. So, a lot of people wanted to see him mm-hmm. dead. Then on February 1st, a few days later, Burke was publicly dissected by Professor Munro. Oh. Who was the man that they originally tried to send yeah. Donald's body to. I was wondering, is it, is it Professor Knox? Mm-hmm. Is he going to do it? That'd no. be a bit weird. And this dissection was another huge deal. Uh, tickets were sold <laughs> for the event. Quotes. <laughs> But way more students showed up than there were tickets because they wanted to watch. Mm -hmm. They wanted to see it. And so many turned up and were then refused entry because they didn't have a ticket that they started a riot. What? Police were called. Jesus. It was mayhem. And they were only stopped when they were able to negotiate with a university professor that groups of 50 would be allowed into the theatre and ushered through after the dissection had happened. So that's the only reason they stopped rioting was because they were told they were going to be allowed in. Yeah, oh man. Isn't that insane? That is absolutely insane. To watch a dissection, or to see a dissected body. To see a dissected murder. And I would have thought that would be enough, but they went further with Burke's body than that. I was going to say, did they they preserve his skeleton? Well, Mm. a book would later be bound with some of his skin. Oh, no. Oh. What book? I don't know. What? Oh. I don't know. Some people have said, because this book exists, they still have it. They still have it. And some people say that it was bound just with, like, normal cow leather, and, like, they say it's the skin. But apparently that was a thing. And then, I think this is even worse... Professor Munro took some of Burke's blood during the dissection and used it as ink to write a note. And the note, sa- they have this note. Oh. The note says, this is written with the blood of William Burke, who was hanged at Edinburgh. This blood was taken from his head. <laughs> what? The actual fuck? I know, I know. Oh, Jesus Christ. But there are photos of this note. What? Oh. Of what I oh I don't understand why you would oh this is why I gave the disclaimer at the top of the episode because what the hell what, the actual, <laughs> what is this what the actual fuck man so in answer to your previous question Burke's skeleton was preserved and it was given to the anatomical museum of Edinburgh Medical School where it still remains you can still see it. There are, there's photos online, you can still see the skeleton. Oh. And the book, the note, and a death mask that was made of Burke oh, are yeah. also available to view. But I think they're at the Surgeon's Hall Museum, which I think is a different place or a different building. I'm not too sure. But death masks were a fairly common thing. Yeah. Um, like That's fairly inoffensive. It's just a plaster cast of someone's face once they've died. Like Quite a lot of people have death masks. Mm-hmm. They actually also took a life mask of hair, which they have, oh. because he wasn't executed. Mm-hmm. So they took a plaster cast of his face while he was still living. They have both. But that's what happened to Burke. Jesus. But now you might be wondering, what happened to the rest of them? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you don't want to know. Maybe you just want to leave. Uh, no, I'm, I'm curious. I want to know. Okay, well, Nellie was released the day after the trial. Mm-hmm. But she was soon cornered by an angry mob. I was wondering. And she had to be taken into a police station for her own safety. Mm -hmm. They were going to kill her. They were furious that 
it was not proven that they would have killed her. Would have uh, torn her to pieces. Yeah. She tried to see Burke before he was executed, but she wasn't allowed. Mm. He wasn't allowed any visitors. So when she wasn't allowed to go see him, she left Edinburgh. But nobody knows what happened to her. She just disappears. She leaves Edinburgh and she vanishes completely. That'd be a hell of one to come up on, like, the ancestry things you do. Well, actually, I don't think I have it in my notes, but there's a researcher called Janet Philp who traced Burke's family tree. And she believes that she found a woman on this family tree who is Burke's niece Hmm. and has traced that to a great-granddaughter who lives in America currently. And she's contacted her. They've been in touch because she believes that she's related to Burke. Oh, no. That's like, that's just something I read. I wasn't going to put it in because I didn't think we'd have time, but that's that's something that's happened. Imagine just getting that email out the blue. Oh, hey, I'm just like a researcher. I thought you might want to know that you're related to a murderer from mm-hmm. 200 years ago. A particularly atrocious murderer. Yeah. So that's that's actually a thing. Mm-hmm. And I imagine if they have the skeleton, they could probably extract DNA. Oh, probably, yeah. I don't see why they would. I don't see them doing that, mm. but, you know, it's a thing. But yeah, they've gotten in touch with a descendant. Mm. But because, like, largely they don't really know what happened to, you know, like, Nelly, mm. so they can't. There's no, no way to trace that. Unless she was honest about who she was. But I don't see why she would be. No, presumably she'd change her name. Mm-hmm. Margaret Hare was released on the 19th of January. Because remember, she was never charged mm-hmm. properly with anything. And she decided to try and travel back to Ireland. And that's where she was from. And I'm assuming that she travelled with her daughter, but it doesn't actually say whether or not she did. Hmm. So, you know, there is a chance that her daughter was adopted she by some died. other family. Well, yeah, like, I, d- I don't yeah. know. I don't know. I don't think she would have died in that time because... A whooping cough? I don't... I don't know. I feel like I would have said mm. if the child had died. It just doesn't say that she did travel with her daughter, I'm assuming. Mm-hmm. But she was also attacked by an angry mob in Glasgow. That's where she was trying mm. to sail from. They recognised who she was and what she'd gotten away with. So just like Nelly, she was taken into a police station for protection and then she was given a police escort onto a boat that was going to Belfast. Mm-hmm. And she also disappeared. Nobody knows what happened oh. to her after that. i alive. They just know that she was bound for Ireland and that's it. Maybe we're related. I have Ireland ancestors. No. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be a horrible twist of fate, wouldn't it? Yeah. Knox's career kind of died after the trial. He was never criminally charged, but he was a laughing stock mm-hmm. amongst his peers. He was just ridiculed as being an awful man. An angry crowd burned an effigy of him outside his house. Holy shit. Because remember, I said that they... They believed he should have been on trial just yeah. the same as they were. But I found I found this kind of funny. Maybe I shouldn't have. The papers kind of, they thought he was guilty, but mm-hmm. they knew they had to be careful about what they said because he was found innocent. So if they were too outright or too accusatory in what they wrote about him, he could sue them mm-hmm. for libel, I think. Or slander, one of the two. I think libel might be when it's in print. Mm. Can't remember. They could. He could sue them. Yeah. So instead of referring to him by name, they referred to him by calling him like noxious or obnoxious <laughs> because his name was Knox. Yeah. So that's how they referred to him. <laughs> so you couldn't actually prove that they were talking about him, which I thought was kind of funny. I, don't know. I probably shouldn't. It's kind of funny. It's not very subtle, is it? <laughs> no, but I'm assuming it was enough. That Mr. Obnoxious. <laughs> doctor obnoxious <laughs> but he was basically cut out of university life by his colleagues so even though like, he wasn't fired but nobody wanted to associate with him anymore so he didn't run in the same circles that he used to he wasn't invited to events he was just cut out excluded from everything that they did yeah he didn't get away with anything he still things became a lot harder for him yeah it wasn't just a sweep back to normal no nobody wanted anything to do with him anymore Mm -hmm. so he actually moved to england he left but when he was down there i don't know what he did but he basically broke some rules and was eventually banned from lecturing by the royal college of surgeons wow i don't know what he did i couldn't find that anywhere 
and he ended up just running his own medical practice oh. and and he did that until he died in 1862 wow so that was dr knox hmm but what about hair what happened to hair he wasn't released until february 5th because the police thought they would be able to smuggle him out more quietly if it was later, mm-hmm. rather than immediately as the trial ended, when everyone knew he would be leaving the police station. They thought that they would have an easier time of it if they waited. And they managed to smuggle him onto a train to Dumfries, which is down near the border, mm-hmm. in disguise. But he was recognised by part of the legal team that represented Daft Jamie's family during the trial. Uh-oh. He was on the same train. It was a man called Erskine Douglas Sanford. So he he recognised him. Well, he shat a, <laughs> shat a brick. Holy shit, there's a murder on this train. Quite the opposite. He had no problem outing that Hare was on the train. <laughs> he told everybody that Hare was on the train and he was going to be getting off in Dumfries. Told everyone. Which meant that when the train got to Dumfries and everyone got off... Word got round really quickly that he was on the train and everyone knew where he was going to be staying. Oh. So that's what Sanford did. He wasn't scared. He he was going to have him. Mm. So Hare couldn't stay where he was scheduled to that night because a huge crowd gathered outside. And it was really bad. Like it was they were throwing stones through windows. There was all kinds of stuff that they were they were going to kill him. Mm-hmm. But Police managed to get him out, even though it was a bit touch and go. Like, he was in the building, but he had to escape out of a back window. (laughs) And police organised this decoy coach, and they bundled someone into it, hoping the crowd would think it was hair, and then the coach left. (laughs) So the crowd kind of dispersed after Mm -hmm. that, because they thought he was gone. But he wasn't. Early then, this is like something out of a movie. Like, I can see this scene happening in my head. But really, really early the next morning, like dawn, Mm -hmm. before dawn, Hare was escorted by police out of Dumfries. And he was told to walk to England (laughs) and cross the border and never come back. (laughs) Did he? Nobody knows what happened to him after that. Oh my God. They assume that he did. Yeah. But he was never properly seen again. There were loads of supposed sightings, Mm -hmm. which is what usually happens. And there's a few theories about what happened to him. Apparently, he found work in a lime pit, but he was recognised, and then he was thrown into the pit by his fellow workers, which left him blind. That was one story. Another story said that he was forced to become a beggar on the streets of London, because he had no work, nobody, no nothing. Some people said that he returned home to Ireland... Other people think that he emigrated to America. We don't know what happened to him. He vanished. With just his demons for company. Mm -hmm. Jesus. Just that he was told to walk to England and not come back. Mm -hmm. The awful things that they did actually prompted uh, the Parliament into action. And they introduced the Anatomy Act of 1831. Which basically meant now that medical professionals could dissect bodies that came from workhouses if they hadn't been claimed within 48 hours. Hmm. So, unfortunately, there were enough of these bodies that anatomy murders were no longer profitable. Oh. They were getting enough bodies now that they didn't need to buy them. Man, it's horrible that that's what it takes. It's just, Hmm. it comes down to profits. This law also stopped the practice of dissecting convicted murderers. That didn't happen anymore. Oh. But yeah, they were getting bodies from another source, which meant it wasn't profitable to murder for science anymore. Yeah. And that was a direct result of this. I think I read somewhere that... Was it two boys? Or one boy? Was murdered in East London in 1831. And the murderers were inspired by Burke and Hare. They had heard what happened and they did the same thing. Oh, God. So when that happened, they knew they had to act. So this law was brought in. And today you can still go to where Burke was hanged. It's marked by several brass plaques in Edinburgh. You can go and stand in the place where it happened. 
And the last executions to happen in the UK were in 1964. Two men were hanged after killing their friend for some money. And the death penalty was abolished in the UK in 1965. Damn. And that is the story of Burke and Hare. What an epic. (laughs) What stands out for me, I think, is that it's crazy. Because before I heard the actual story, I knew that they were murderers who did it for bodies to sell. But there were these, like, monsters in my head. Obviously, they were actually monsters. Mm -hmm. It's a different kind from what you understand when you're little. Yeah, but they were, like, they lurked in the shadows and they were just nothing but sinister and they pounced on their victims with this huge mad struggle. Not that they were drunks. Mm -hmm. And they were... I mean, they still snatched people and tricked them into coming, but it was, I don't know, more casual... They're just like, oh, come on and have some whiskey. Like, oh, okay. You seem pretty sound. We're just chatting. That's fun. And then they murder them mm-hmm. and then just heave them in a, a tea chest. It's 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 more horrible because it's more believable. Mm-hmm. It's just what people would do, not what monsters would do, if that makes sense. Well, it, when you describe it like that, it could happen to anyone. Yeah. It's not just someone who's wandering about in a dark alley. Mm-hmm. That that could happen to anybody. Yeah. What I found interesting is how things have gotten muddled over time. So grave robbing is usually what puts Burke and Hare in your head. Mm-hmm. But they were never grave robbers. Yeah. Ever. That's quite weird, isn't They it? never robbed a grave. That's what I thought, that they robbed graves and then ran out of graves to rob. Nope. Other people did. Other people ran out of graves to rob, but they were never grave robbers. It's funny how often that comes into the narrative. Yeah. But never. It just sets the scene for the times. It just, they were the next step. Yes. Because grave robbing got so difficult. They represented the next step Mm -hmm. in how you would make money fulfilling that need. If that makes sense. Yeah. That's what I found... Interesting that it's part of the legend, the grave robbers, Burke and Hare, but they never were. Mm. They were something much worse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. As horrible as it was, did you enjoy the story? I thoroughly enjoyed the story. <laughs> I rated 17 coffins out of 17. <laughs> which is. It hits dead now, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Oh. My throat is so sore. This was such a big story. <laughs> yeah. If you're listening, we think this will be the end of part two, mm-hmm. but we've just recorded it all at once and we're going to go back and put in part one. This is the longest recording we've done. It is. This has been mega. This is mega. What a good story, though. Oh. <laughs> I know. I well, mean, we had to talk about them. We couldn't do this podcast with the genre that we're in and not talk about Burke and Hare. Not have Burke and Hare. What happened to Hare, though? I know. That's the worst part. He was never punished. Yeah. Not really. I mean, no. his life probably wasn't very easy after that. Like, he had to leave everything, but... No. He he murdered 17 people, and he just walked away. Yeah. Walked he threw England. his friend under the bus and left. He wasn't even at the execution. He was still in jail. Oh, man. Oh. Mm-hmm. That's the scariest part for me. At least you know that Burke was dead. Yeah. You know, hair's dead by now. (laughs) Can you imagine being in Edinburgh at that time and knowing that hair got away with it? And, like, the three of the four of them Mm -hmm. all just left. Mm -hmm. Walked away. Oh. Madness. It puts puts a chill in you when you think about it. Gives you the heebie-jeebies. Yeah. It's quite spooky. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you very much if you've made it to the end of the story this was a big one this was a big one i wasn't anticipating on it being this long thank you very much for listening but there's so much detail yeah and so much i couldn't take it out there was nothing i could take out <laughs> can't edit this down no and if you want to see any of the show notes it's generally spooky.com yes so links pictures all that kind of stuff that's in the show notes yeah you can check it out and you follow us on instagram yes any photos of things I've talked about 
I will be posting there. So you could check out Instagram while you listen and then you know what I'm talking about. Yep, yep. Other than that, thank you very much. And we shall see you next week. Yes. Bye. Bye.